Today, we're taking a closer look at a company that has just recently began trading on the CSC called Mind Life Sciences, their stock ticker being MYND. This is a company that is taking a very unique approach to treating major depression disorder and one that you may never have heard of before today. In order to do that, we're bringing on the CEO and co-founder of Mind Life, Mind Life Sciences, Dr. Lyle Oberg. Welcome, my good sir. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Now, we we're going to go through your bio and all of that, but I understand uh, how much you've done within your career. So I'm going to allow you to speak for this. But for, if you don't mind, for those who may not have heard your company before, or maybe they haven't heard of yourself before, can you give us a brief overview of your past work experience that led you to taking on your current role with the company, but also what you aim to accomplish with Mind Life Sciences? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm a medical doctor by profession. And in 1993, I had a, a brief glimpse into insanity and went into politics for 15 years. I became Minister of Social Services, Minister of Learning, Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation, Minister of Finance in the, in the province of Alberta. I then went on and became CEO of a startup gene sequencing company. Uh, I became the, one of the founders of Flower and the first CEO transitioning to become Chief Medical Officer. Um, I then I now sit on about four or five boards, different boards. Several of them are listed on TSX uh, as well. Um, about a year ago, I was asked by Dr. Wilf Jeffries, our chief scientist, to take a look at his company and take a look at what he was doing. And I became quite amazed at what he had discovered. So I started working with him and ultimately ended up to where I am today, which is CEO of uh, Mind Life Sciences. I believe one of the up and coming companies uh, in the psychedelic space. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really important for investors to know that you're taking that unique approach, like I was mentioning earlier, uh, to psilocybin that is treating major depression disorder, but in a way, like I said earlier as well, that's very unique. Can you explain a little bit more about the drug that you're looking to, uh, to create that really targets sure. inflammation and how inflammation is linked to treating depression? Absolutely. Um, over the past few years, the theory of depression has changed and it's gone from just being a myriad of symptoms uh, that led to uh, um, decreasing in function to an actual disease. And, and what it started off with was linking rheumatoid arthritis with depression. And depression was not, well, I'm sad because I have rheumatoid arthritis. It was found that it's actually the same cause, which is an inflammatory process. So Dr. Jeffries and his team had been studying a particular gene for about 10 years, and they then went and looked at a U.S. study. And the U.S. study of major depressive disorders, they had 14 and a half thousand people, and the gene in common was actually the anti-inflammatory gene that Dr. Jeffries had been discovering. So he went on and did mouse trials and, and actually discovered that he could change a depressed mouse, and yes, there are such things as depressed mice, um, into a non-depressed mouse by increasing this gene. So the next step and is to um, essentially see how this works in humans, see how it works in people. Uh, we feel that we've really uh, discovered the trigger, so to speak, of uh, depression in humans. And it comes on the, the um, heels of the whole inflammatory process theory. And again, if you think about it, um, psilocybin, has been shown to stop depression. I think we're beyond the if psilocybin can do it. Um, it's been shown to do that, and in many cases, it's just a single dose. So where we're at now is we are looking at the how and why it works. Like, why does psilocybin work? How does it work? And we feel that we've identified that. Yeah, absolutely. And what I find very interesting is that when people think of psilocybin for depression, they think of going to a clinic, they think of taking a dose and you're having a psychedelic trip. That's part of the process. Yes. This is not the case from my understanding. You're actually looking to bring it down to a single molecule in which they can take it and potentially not have that psychoactive experience. Is that correct? Yeah, our, our uh, lead scientist uh, has a saying and his saying is he wants to take the fun out of psilocybin. And absolutely, that's what we're looking to do. Um, we're looking to um, move on the parts of psilocybin that are the anti-inflammatory components. And we feel those are what actually stops the depression. Um, the, the hallucinatory side of it 
may or may not be an adjunct to it, but we really feel it's the anti-inflammatory component working on the pathway that we've identified that actually stops depression. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love the fact that, uh, you know, as you had mentioned before, we've been working on this for almost 10 years since 2013. And even having the knockout mice ready to go for trials coming up, which we'll speak about in a moment, all the different trials, but I find that very fascinating. But in the world of medicine and biotech, a company is only as strong as the team it puts together. If you don't mind going over uh, your executive team, but more specifically as well, your scientific advisory board that will be leading Mind Life Sciences. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Jeffries, uh, you know, is an all-star in the research and development field. Um, he has over 60 patents. He's been published over 100 times. Um, he's been 30 years at the Michael Smith Laboratory at UBC. And UBC, obviously, is one of the leading institutions in Canada, you know, and probably one of the top 20 or 30 in the world, to be honest. And the Michael Smith Laboratory is right at the top of that. So Dr. Jeffries, you know, is, is one of the top researchers. We've also brought on uh, a lady by the name of Dr. Irina Serenkova, and she's very unique in that she's an MD, medical doctor, as well as a PhD, who specializes in clinical trials. Um, she's taken courses. She came to us from the Vancouver Prostate Institute, where she led their clinical trials, and we feel she's going to be a, a huge adjunct to what we're doing. Our chief operating officer is a gentleman by the name of Jordan Cleland, and he has an interesting background because it actually comes from the post-secondary administration. And we feel that's important because we're going to be dealing with universities right around the world. And to have someone who can navigate the bureaucracy at a post-secondary institution is incredibly important to us. And, and Jordan brings that uh, to our team. Our scientific advisory board is, is really interesting. And I'll just take a minute to explain a scientific advisory board. Um, many people kind of put people out there for their all-star name. See, this person is an all-star and he's on our scientific advisory board. Well, we've gone one step further. Yeah, we want all-stars. But we also want people who can help us and people who have a knowledge in what we're doing. So if we get stumped, we can go to them and say, listen, what do you think about this? Can you give me a different perspective? And we have people like Dr. Joe Martin from a former dean of Harvard, a medical school and neurologist. Uh, he set up various neurology institutes around the U.S. We have Dr. Michael Brownstein from the NIH. He's a scientist emeritus from the NIH. Again, as we go through the FDA, his experience is going to be critical to us. Uh, we have Dr. Mark Geyer out of UC San Diego, who was the, one of the founders of the Hefter Institute on Psychedelic Research. And again, he's been doing this for 30 years, so a huge addition to our team. And then, then our, our last one is a gentleman out of uh, Cambridge, Dr. John Trousdale. And uh, he is an immunogeneticist and uh, is a scientist emeritus at Cambridge. So we've, we're collecting people from around the world, but these people actually will help us. So they're incredibly important to what we do. Absolutely. And speaking about what you do, I know that we already spoke about you're going to be targeting inflammation as one of the trials, but are there other things as well that you'll be looking at within the uh, psilocybin world that you'll be turning your attention, your board's attention, but also that uh, advisory board as well? Yeah, absolutely. So what we started off with and how we began this trip was actually looking at sepsis and cytokine storm. Um, because they're in super inflammatory conditions is probably a really good terminology for it. Um, sepsis has a 30% death rate. So if you get sepsis, there's a 30% chance that you will die. Uh, what we've discovered is the gene that is there actually turns, is a trigger gene, and it turns M1 macrophages, which are the pro-inflammatory, that cause the inflammatory state, into M2 macrophages, which are anti-inflammatory, and that, which stops the sepsis, which stops the cytokine storm. And indeed, we have evidence, certainly in animal models, that that is the case. So we'll be looking at that. And then if you kind of expand out a little bit, um, if you want to think about, we now are calling depression, we're now calling sepsis some of these actual diseases. And with an actual disease, because of the inflammatory component, you can now get a biomarker and determine if you have the disease and are you getting worse or are you getting better? And yes, we have discovered and patented a biomarker uh, that potentially will do this. 
So this is huge as well, and in many ways, it's almost as big as the medication is for treating depression because now we can diagnose it. And it's not just a group of symptoms, not just a myriad of symptoms, it's actually a diagnosis. And that's what we're working on as well. So this gene has provided us with a huge amount of opportunity to expand in the disease world with treatment, with diagnosis, and it's gonna be really interesting how this all works. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm very interested both just uh, as an investor, but someone who believes in psychedelic, uh, psychedelic medicine as well, to see where you go with all of these. But uh, lastly, as a company that has recently gone public, I can imagine that investors are always, they love to expect what to see coming next for your company. If you don't mind just telling uh, investors, you know, what should they be expecting? What should they be excited for over the coming weeks and months now that you're public? Oh, there's, there's going to be a lot of announcements coming out. Um, we've got a lot of things that uh, we'll be telling the investors will be very, very transparent. Over the next few months, though, and we expect by, by the fourth quarter, we'll have at least four and possibly six studies up and going, clinical trials. Uh, we're working with a group out of Australia. We're working with a group out of the U.S. And uh, so we'll really be breaking ground, so to speak, in proving out this gene. We'll be finishing our preclinical trials. We'll be moving forward with this. So I think there's going to be a lot for investors over the next short while. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Berg, I appreciate very much for your time throughout all of this, answering these questions. Congratulations, getting that step of being public. But there's lots to go uh, for your company. I'm very excited for that. And, and as anybody who follows our network knows, we'll be doing more interviews with yourself and your team to really get a better understanding of your company, but also to keep up with all the different news releases, milestones and different things coming out. So I appreciate very much and look forward to speaking to you uh, again very soon as well. Yeah, thank you very much.